had a good time too. I mean, when you when you were young too. Eh? But talk to me a bit more about the collective then, because it's all very well to say you were young, you wanted to drink, you had an adventure, you rode around with the guys, and but there was something about the collective that sparked something in you, rather than let's do another Noel Coward, let's do another Alan Lakeborn, let's do another Harold Pinter. Well, again, I mean, the, the, the cruel fact of the, <laughs> the collective was, because, and, and the kind of nominal philosophy behind it, nobody's written a play about this, so we'll have to do it. You know, nobody's written a play about the farmers. Nobody's written a play about 1837. And though even Rick Salutin was there as a writer, but he was there more as a political commissar to make sense of the historical things we're reading. But even that, the great thing is that you had to go out and talk to real people. You had to get information to bring back to the collective. Nobody Why was, was that important to you, Eric? Well, again, what's important, period, it gets actors out of imitating other actors. It, they have to suddenly you're confronted with real people. And it really puts you on to, and it was like I used to weep before I went to rehearsal. I'd think out nothing. And you couldn't just come back and talk about it either. You had to come back and present it like show and tell to the rest of the group in some theatrical way. You had to sing a song. You had to, you know, <laughs> juggle your balls, <laughs> whatever you had to do, you know. You had to stand in your head. You had to say, no, I'm going to do a scene. This is, you know, you had to go, you had to do this stuff. And you had to do it. So it was like, and so after work, after rehearsal, you, and if you didn't do something, you just didn't get in the play. It was a horrendously kind of, you know, if you didn't come up with something. So there was attrition? Like Absolutely. Well, how can you be in the play if you're not bringing anything to put in the play? It wasn't done with a punishment. So 16 done. actors start and there's only 10? No, no, they would do. But there was always people who wanted to, I can't take this. It was very stressful, put it that way. Because you also had an opening night. So you'd have your rehearsal period. It wasn't, this, it wasn't a workshop. And we're not, you know, th this is just the first stage. This was, we have no idea what we're going to do, but in six weeks or four weeks is opening night. Tickets are being sold as we speak. So there was a, a great pressure to it. And but so that going out and finding things was wonderful. And again, it's part and parcel of your part of a community. So for 1837, uh, the Farmers' Revolt. So you're looking at Montgomery, you're looking at... William Lyman Mackenzie, you're looking at John Strong, you're looking at all the figures, yes. is that what yeah. you're doing, then yeah. bringing them well, back in rehearsal? Well, or yeah, what, you know, so you're reading like mad, but you're also, because we're rehearsing in the country, and that, you know, we're Van Eggman and all those guys, these farmers coming down here, so you're already taking the contemporary, anybody that's around, you're trying to imitate and use them as this, as, right. as a character in this. And I was always like, 1837, I was going to be William Lyon Mackenzie. That was decided. So I, and they, How so. How was that decided? I don't know. It was just decided. Because you are William Lyon <laughs> Mackenzie. <laughs> no, I had no idea. I was William Lyon Mackenzie. And what William Lyon Mackenzie was actually going to do in the play, that wasn't decided. But I was going to be him. So we would do like exercises where people would come in with different scenes and I would have to react to them as William Lyon Mackenzie, having a clue who he was or how he did it. I'm still trying to keep up and remember <laughs> because it's going to open, right? And Thompson kept going. So we're go this is like, and I was, there was then the big speech, the one that we started this conversation was, the big speech. And I'd never done a big speech. <laughs> So we're going to go over to Wingham, to the television show, and Thompson's going, well, do this scene, scene, and Mackenzie's big speech. <laughs> I've never done a big speech. I'm telling you. It's like, so I was living at Cedric Smith's old farm. Uh, I was boarding with his, uh, his ex-wife at that point. So I'd be out in the back lot just trying to make up this speech, which is we did. But the speech what by did you make it up? But it was written down, wasn't it? No, I, I wrote it, but I wrote it from reading about these things and bringing these kind of the kind of the humor that I had, which was uh, or not. So wait a minute, that speech you did in front of Queens Park and City Hall was in fact not historical. That's Eric Peterson. Yeah. Knock me down. Talk I mean, there was historicity. There was historical things in it. Right. You know, I'm at references to it. Turkey shoots, for example, but that whole thing, you know, but let's. You know, uh, it was discovered by me out of sheer f desperation wow. because we were going to Wingham, and there were. And so the first time I ever gave that speech was in this televised, and you should have seen the company. They were just like they were very pleased with me. I must say, they just cheered, and that was the first time I ever did it. 
And it became this speech that we could use over and over again in you know, the amalgamation. I can't remember. Free trade, I think I did it. Free trade, amalgamation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, the, but again, it goes back to the, the kind of voltage inside you that I see, admire, worship, and we'll go and see. It's this voltage of authenticity. And if that speech you know, is yours, but from historical bits and pieces, it has Eric Peterson's authenticity of a guy growing up in Saskatchewan who has a concern about his country, about his people, about tyranny, yeah. about yeah. whatever. Yeah. No, it's based on, you know, it's my, and on my repertoire of characters, you know. The, uh, you could look at William Lyon McKenzie now and see a bit of Oscar Leroy from Corner Gas. Yep. You know, the pissed off, the, and the rabble, you know. Yep. And, I mean, it's my palette, you know, and uh, I mean, um, and I wasn't going for like a character thing either. It was all about content. So I wasn't doing a Scots accent. I wasn't looking at how he looked, although I do look somewhat like him. Um, little little face, you know. He's got a little face like me. Uh, but it was no. It was about content fed by this group, this idea, and Rick Salutin saying this is a failed. This was a this was a war of independence. This was serious business of um, these reformer and throwing out he was a madman, he was a lunatic, all the other kind of uh, stuff about him, which is again, poetic license, it's a great choice. I mean, you can read historical stuff and go, well, he wasn't like that at all. Didn't matter a f It was what this piece was trying to say and the power of this piece. And but it's both about the collective, it's a collective with a form, right? And yeah. it's also about William Lyon Mackenzie, the collective with the farmers of Ontario, standing up collectively to yeah. uh, the family compact. To so the family the compact. Yeah, and we, had, you know, so. we had great fun playing family compact people, because then you could actually satirize the whole colonial aspect. You'd be brought up, you talking about you know, making the you know, bladders of pride and arrogance. <laughs> it was great fun. And a wonderful group of people. I mean, a wonderfully inventive. I mean, when you look at that cast, I mean, all of them were, you know. Fox. Miles Potter. Potter. Um, Janet Amos, Annie England, Ted Johnson, <laughs> I mean, you know. And yeah, it was, it was, it was Terry Tweed. Terry Tweed was really good at them. She would always be hectoring us as characters. But talk a bit more about the collective form, because you did other collectives, but then you've done a lot of author plays as well. Do you well, prefer again, one form or the other, no, or no, was it I the... just think that the, both of them have their... The trouble with the collective form, I, I guess, is that in the end, it's hard to form. Because really, and so a lot of them were shows. The farm show, the oil show, you know, we, we, we did this, the immigrant show in Toronto, which means they were just a series of skits around a general theme. So you didn't have to have, and again, in an improvised, you know, mostly they were improvised and then set as scenes, that was how they were written. So, and sometimes that doesn't lead to a very disciplined kind of scene. You could get a lot further, it, you might argue, uh, on, in, on one hand in a form way, uh, in the theatrical writing, if one, one person wrote it. But what it made up for was the kind of terrible energy and belief of the people who made it up saying it to you. Yep. And, you know, it, so it would be a bit long-winded. And Ned Thompson, God bless him, isn't a great editor. He could watch, you know, he just loves to, he's like a kid watching something. He just sits there and he just goes on and on. So he wasn't in that way a really disciplined director about focusing and things like that. So the energy of that kind of commitment and the energy of actors actually discovering that material themselves in a real world. Not, I'm not playing Brad Pitt or Paul Newman or this is how they act in TV. This was like, I mean, I, especially when in, like, in the oil show would be a perfect example, where you were actually interviewing people in the community and then trying to imitate them. Like, just, just imitate them. Why? Which is, well, because they, there was a, a real kind of power in trying to imitate somebody, it, as well as, you know. So Charlie Fairbanks, 
you know, you're trying to talk, and it made you act in different ways that you didn't think were it was possible because you weren't imitating Paul Newman for one thing. You were, you know, it opened your mind uh, in in a different pos to different possibilities. But you were also you're you're part of a you're part of a generation that created a kit start the created Canadian palette and the Canadian sort of subject matter and the Canadian characters, and there you are going to England, and they're full of all the accents. I could do a Suffolk accent or a Norfolk accent or a Cockney accent, or whatever. So they come with a kit bag of accidents of accents and characters, but we. Didn't didn't have any. Well, again, so there there, you it's are. not only a kickback, it's also they're doing their own culture yeah. about their own neighbors in the same way. So it's not the kickback so much, it's the intent. Yes. It's what you're doing. So we weren't doing that in Canada. We, for some reason, we thought to do a play, it had to be their kickback. Yep. And we totally missed the goddamn point. Decades of servant parts at Stratford, all with a Cockney accent. I thought, Hmm, yeah. this is uh, Stratford, well, again, Ontario. Yeah. Why do we have Cockneys no. on stage? And it's again why I like to see Shakespeare really pulled apart and set here or whatever you're going to do with it.